is indeed Norman Gutfield <laughs> and I'm a retired pediatric neurosurgeon and I practiced in England until 1975 and since then I've mostly been working either in the United States of America or uh, for an, at least for an American company uh, and today I've been asked to talk a little bit about something that is now called shaken baby sy syndrome and I'm going to tell you straight away the name is not mine and I think it's just thoroughly unscientific because it's a situation in which you're presuming what you think you're setting out to prove. Now what I mean by that is this. Um, there are a lot of uh, what are called syndromes in clinical medicine and they're mostly called after either the man who or woman who first discovered them or they're called after the presenting feature of the illness. Now for example, I'm sure most of you have uh, heard at least of people with Parkinson's disease and it's called Parkinson's disease because Dr. Parkinson was the first one to classify it more or less correctly about a century ago and the, uh, the other way that they, you can uh, identify these syndromes is by calling them after the presenting feature for example there's a rare condition in which people's um, joints and skin sort of freeze up and uh, it's called stiff man syndrome. But here we're doing something rather different, aren't we? We're, we're call, calling this thing shaken baby syndrome, which means we're assuming we know what it is before we've even defined it. That's no way to practice science, is it? And um, it's a great pity, I think, that the name ever got attached to what it has got attached to. And um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the um, my own personal view. I've been studying the, this thing called subdural hematoma for at least 50, 60 years, yes. I think my first paper was written around from 1952. And um, it's a, a very interesting condition f from the doctor's point of view for a number of reasons, which we don't have time to go into today. Before you started your surgeries, did people realize how often there were no. subdural hematomas? Uh, no, one of the uh, uh, interesting things about this condition is how often it began to crop up once people started to look for it and of course in doing that we've been greatly aided by the development of what is now called neuroimaging in other words special x-ray or um, other physical features which uh, uh, enable you to distinguish the structures inside the skull without actually taking the skull to pieces. The next point I would like to uh, address, because I think you guys have a right to know it, is this, that the further we go into the research into um, what happens when the central nervous system of the brain uh, is uh, assaulted in any way. 
uh, cannot be predicted just by looking at the force that was applied to it. Um, I can claim to have been involved in this for quite a long time because I can remember when I was uh, doing my residency training in the early 1940s how uh, my mentor, Geoffrey Jefferson, the famous British neurosurgeon, had protested that here in his own words, uh, when you looked at a head injury, the eye, the eye rested upon the x-rays of the fractured skull and the mind traveled no further. In other words, ridiculous though it now seems, uh, we were admitting patients on the basis of a fractured skull, but what was really wrong with them was a brain injury. The skull fracture doesn't matter, matter all that much. It's what happened to the underlying brain that's the, the, the um, cause of all the trouble. And uh, this is the case not only if there's a skull fracture, but also if there's just a shaking up of the brain inside the skull. And this is a, pretty much a new thing. Um, it was realized about 50, 60 years ago, at the first neurosurgical meeting that I ever attended, um, an engine, bio, a bio engineer called uh, Mr. Holborn uh, read a paper in which he pointed out that since the brain inside the skull is a, consists of soft brain tissue, water, blood vessels, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, therefore, when it is suddenly sh shaken, hit, um, or whatever, it's going to uh, suffer individual injuries to quite literally hundreds of thousands of cells, all of which are going to react slightly differently. That being so, you can't possibly uh, say that by doing, by um, inflicting such and such a force, it's going to have such and such a result and none other. It's true that it's going to have, um, that the likely thing is that such and such an injury will lead to particularly to uh, bruising of one particular part of the brain and so on and so forth. But you can't just say, well, uh, um, I believe that that uh, particular uh, cause of injury happened. Therefore, this is exact, this that I tell you now is going to be exactly what the child will be left with. It just doesn't happen. Here's what happened. I'd been seeing a number of patients with this thing, subdural hematoma, which means an effusion of blood between the skull and the brain, and uh, they sort of didn't fit. They hadn't had any severe uh, injury, such as uh, you know a bang on the head or a motor accident or something like that. On the contrary, what I found by uh, friendly questioning was that these were children who had been naughty and who had been corrected by their parents by shaking. Now, that sounds a stupid thing to do, but it was in fact 
permissible in my part of the north of England at the time. It was sort of traditional. You, you, you took your child and you just gave it a bit of a shake and the child, uh, allegedly at least, uh, immediately became good again. And um, in this case, what happened was that the children were not, uh, did not fully recover. Uh, they usually were temporarily uh, dazed, if not unconscious, and then uh, later they might develop uh, seizures or they might uh, vomit, etc., etc. As I say, these children, are, I believe, were shaken. And the reason I believe it is that my social worker and I sat down with the parents and asked them to explain what, how them they thought their children had got into the condition which needed them to be taken to hospital, and that's what the parents said. I don't believe that the parents had any motive to lie to me, and equally they weren't particularly frightened. And I suggest that you might contrast that in your own minds with what happened when you or members of your family were accused by the police. Did you have that sort of sympathetic hearing, I wonder? I'll leave you to answer. Originally, mine and Kathy's names were associated with, uh, with shaking on what appeared to be pretty good evidence. And it was only quite recently that I realized the enormity of what had happened. called one evening by a lady from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I was living in Tucson at the time and she introduced herself as a member of the Innocence Project and uh, said that she had a case where, that he, she would be very grateful if I would uh, look at and perhaps give her an opinion on. And at first I was not too keen on this because I, I had retired at least 10 years before, I think rather longer. And so I um, looked at this case and frankly I was horrified. This was nothing like my series of almost friendly shaking it was a case of an obviously grievously ill child being transported by car from its home to a, a hospital and when it got to the hospital it was in effect very near to death and there was reason to suppose that uh, the hospital treatment was uh, how shall we say, uh, not exactly brilliant. And um, I thought to myself, what on earth has happened here? I've now gone through the records in real detail of eight consecutive people who um, have been found guilty and have continued to assert their innocence. Every single damn one of them was plainly, seriously ill. The baby. Two of them had had multiple episodes of uh, seizures, including at least two sta state of semi-lepticosis. 
uh, two had uh, were brought in unconscious and were um, intubated into the stomach. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. Some idiot is in the uh, in that conference said that it didn't do you any harm. But does he? Mm. He really does. Two had undertreated otitis media mm -hmm. with pus pouring out of the, their ears, for God's sake. Um, that's right. Two of them were children who had suffered from intractable e epilepsy ever since their birth and were in fact in what the doctors call status epilepticus, which means continual fits. Now this is in, has a special importance because when the brain is suffering a seizure, it needs a, an awful lot of oxygen to keep up with itself, so to speak. And that is therefore the worst possible time to allow the child's respiration to become obstructed. And sure enough, one of those children uh, was in fact one of the children who in the x-ray department uh, needed resuscitation because it was born. Yes, it needed resuscitation and it didn't receive it. But there is a just one little note saying patient blue, something like that. So a lot of babies have been ill, sometimes partly treated, sometimes not even uh, taken to the doctor. They're in a, a serious state of health and uh, sometimes perhaps they've uh, uh, spluttered, coughed, whatever, and uh, a caregiver has perhaps either not noticed until the pa child has stopped breathing, or perhaps the care caregiver has quite reasonably tried to clear the airway, or you know, or whatever, and um, <coughs> because. Nobody can think of any other explanation. Uh, this child is labelled as having been brutally assaulted by the caregiver. I don't think that's good enough to you. Of course you don't, because <laughs> you're the people who are concerned. Some people feel that I've changed my mind. I think perhaps it's not I that have changed my mind. It's that uh, there has been a change in what is regarded as uh, shaking uh, the, the shaking baby, shaken baby, baby syndrome. I think I still think that you can probably produce a triad of um, uh, retinal hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, and if you like, uh, brain swelling <coughs> uh, by shaking. Uh, I do not assert that that is the cause of the death when a child is left alone with the caretaker and allegedly by the caretaker nothing happens and allegedly by the prosecution the child is shaken to death and I think we need to go back to the drawing board and um, make a more thorough assessment of these fatal cases and I am going to bet uh, donuts to dollars, as I believe the saying is over here, that uh, we're going to find that in every, or at least in the 
large majority of cases, the child had another severe illness of some sort, which was mi missed until too late. So I missed it, but I hear there was a um, session where they talked about Norman Guthkelch coming back into the arena. How did yes, that go? Yes, um, different sessions actually have mentioned Dr. Guthkelch and his re-entry into the Shaken Baby arena. And um, one of the sessions I went to, uh, ironically, um, a guy by the name of Philip Wheeler, who's an investigator from the UK, started talking about Norman Guthkelch, put his picture up, put the Medill Innocence Project, you know, a website up, and said, you know, those people who got him involved in this are just trying to manipulate him. And as I'm sitting in the front row thinking, I think he means those people being me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to say that I, uh, I felt a little bad about getting Norman Guthkelch involved because I knew that he would be controversial and something that people would sort of latch on to and that things would be said about him that would not be favorable just because of his stance in a case or, or you know his position to open it up to all the evidence and let's look at it. Um, so I feel a bit bad about that. I did warn him. But I don't think there's any way to possibly warn people of how much the wrath can come down on you uh, when you get involved in these kind of things. But in the end, I mean, everyone I've talked to that's talked with Dr. Guthkelch, it's amazing the effect he's had on the experts I know, on the people I know. Um, and I think, I'm hoping that he lives a long, long time so that he can meet with as many people that want to meet with him and talk with as many people as can talk to and I think perhaps this is a very good thing, not a bad thing.